I was talking with a Zen master the other day. And he said, <clears throat> you should be my disciple. I looked at him and said, who was Buddha's teacher? <laughs> so he burst into laughter and he gave me a piece of clover. <laughs> So long as you can be persuaded that there's something more that you ought to be than you are. You've divided yourself from reality, from the universe, from God, or whatever you want to call that, the Tat in Tat Vamasi. And you will find constantly, if you if you were interested in anything like this, in psychoanalysis, in uh, Gestalt therapy, in uh, sensitivity training, in any kind of yoga or what have you, that there will be that funny sensation of what I'll call spiritual greed that can be aroused by somebody indicating to you, hmm, there are still higher stages for you to attain. You should meet my guru. <laughs> to be truly realized, you have to get to the point where you're not seeking anymore. So then you begin to think, well, we, 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 will, we will now be non-seekers. <laughs> You know, like disciples of Krishnamurti, who, <laughs> because he says he doesn't read any spiritual books, they can't read anything but mystery stories. <laughs> Becoming uh, spiritually unspiritual. Well, you find that that too is what is called in Zen, legs on a snake. It's irrelevant. You don't need not to seek. Because you don't need anything. And I mean, it's like crawling into a hole and pulling the hole in after you. And the great master of this technique was a Buddhist scholar who lived about uh, 200 AD called Nagarjuna. He invented a whole dialectic. He had a whole school called Madhyamika where the, as it were, leader of the students would simply destroy all their ideas. Absolutely abolish their philosophical notions. And they get the heebie-jeebies. They see he didn't have the heebie-jeebies. He seemed perfectly relaxed in not having any particular point of view. Well, they said, teacher, how can you stand it? We have to have something to hang on to. Who does? Who are you? And eventually you discover, of course, that it's not necessary to hang on to anything. To rely on anything. There's nothing to rely on. Because you're it. It's like the universe. It's like asking the question, where is the universe? And by that I mean the whole universe. <laughs> Whereabouts is it in space? Everything in it is falling around everything else, but there's no concrete floor underneath with the thing to crash because the space you can think of infinite space if you like you don't have to think of curved space the space that goes out and out and out forever and ever and has no end what is that? of course it's you what else could it be? only the universe is delightfully arranged so that as it looks at itself, in order not to be one-sided and prejudiced, it looks at itself from an uncountable number of points of view. We thus avoid solipsism, with, as if I were to have the notion that it's only me that's really here, and you're all in my dream. 
Of course, it's on the, that point of view cannot really be disputed, except by imagining a conference of solipsists, arguing as to which one of them was the one that was really there. <laughs> Now, you see, if you understand what I'm saying with your intelligence and then take the next step and say, but I understood it now, but I didn't feel it. Then next I raise the question, why do you want to feel it? You say, I want something more because that's again that spiritual greed. And you could only say that because you didn't understand it. There is nothing to pursue because you're it. And if you don't know that, you always were it. And if you don't know that, in other words, to put it in Christian terms or Jewish terms, if you don't know that you're God from the beginning, what happens is that you try to become God by force. Therefore, you start being violent and obstreperous and this and that and the other. All our violence, all our competitiveness, all our terrific anxiety to survive is because we didn't know from the beginning that we were it. Well, then you would say if we did know from the beginning, as in fact you did, when you were a baby, well, then everybody says, well, nothing would ever happen. But it did happen, didn't it? And it's, uh, some of it's pretty messy. But what people don't realize is they say, well, uh, take, take the Hindus. It's basic to Hindu religion that we are all God in disguise and that the world is an illusion. All that is a sort of half-truth. But if that is the case, if Hindus and really awakened Hindus by the knowledge of their union with the Godhead would simply become inert. Why then Hindu music? The most incredibly complex, marvelous technique. When they sit and play, they laugh at each other. They're enjoying themselves enormously with these very complicated musical games. But when we come and the symphony orchestra gets up, everybody dresses in evening dress, the most serious expression, and all the audience is down, and you know, it's like it's in a kind of church. And there's none of that terrific zest where the drummer, the tabla player, laughs at the sarod player as they compete with each other in all kinds of marvelous improvisations. So if you do find out by any chance who you really are. <laughs> you, instead of becoming merely lazy, you know, you start laughing. 